beginning, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The hymn that we just sang, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive, well, you know where that comes from, right? The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is something that we pray every Sunday, and hopefully every day in your own life. However, have you ever thought of the implications of that prayer, which we pray? Think about it for a moment. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let's put it like this. Forgive us our sins at the same rate in which we forgive those who sin against us. Now all of a sudden, that prayer should make us a little bit nervous. Because how good are we at forgiving others? We like to hold on to things. Last week we talked about holding on to sin. This week, let's talk about holding on to grudges. I know people who are near 100 years old who held on to grudges all their life. What does that do to a person? It kind of poisons them, and it poisons the relationships that they have with everyone else because they couldn't see it within themselves to forgive. Forgiveness is not easy. Forgiveness is an act of magnanimity there. It is a magnanimous act. It's an act which essentially, I don't know if it sticks our neck out. Say, I'm sorry, that sticks our neck out a little bit. But forgiving, means that we start to see someone, even someone who might have wronged us, is a little bit more equal to ourselves. Equal to ourselves because we stand as forgiven people. Forgiven by God. So also are we called to forgive others. You heard in that we didn't have something this morning that we almost always had. We did not have an epistle lesson this morning. We had two Old Testament readings. The Old Testament reading that was assigned to us today was the second one, Genesis chapter 50. I decided this week to add the second one because the, the, the Old Testament from Genesis 50 talked about how Joseph forgave his brothers for what they had done. I don't want to take for granted that we know what Joseph's brothers did to him. So we heard the story of, well, on Broadway, it was Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat. Joseph had his coat of many colors. He was his father's favorite, and his brothers hated him for it. And so they threw him into a pit. They were going to kill him, but sold him into slavery instead. Now I know about you. But if someone who, or group of people who I care about, who I trusted, did that to me, I'd have an awfully hard time forgiving them. And indeed, forgiveness takes time. I, for someone who's been wronged greatly, for them to forgive immediately, while that is a Christ-like thing, it's difficult. And that's the first lesson I think about our forgiveness is that our forgiveness is not perfect. Ever hear the phrase forgive and forget? What's the problem with that phrase? You can't forget what you can't forgive. Precisely. Forgetting is hard. Now, I made a couple of visits um, earlier this week to uh, some of our shut ins in um, assisted living and nursing facilities. And when we talk about forgetfulness there, that's usually not a good thing. We don't want to be forgetful as we get older. 
But what if I were to tell you that there is such a thing as a divine forgetfulness? How can forgetfulness be divine? I can't remember where I put my glasses this morning until I realized that they were on my face. I did that last week, by the way. I misplaced my glasses and found that they were right here. Or keys, or the name of someone whom we love. But God's forgetfulness is a divine forgetfulness because it's coupled with forgiveness. The purpose of the cross of Christ is that our sins may be forgiven, may be covered over by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so, when God looks down upon you as you have been forgiven, as the blood of the Lamb has washed over you, was the old gospel song. Are you washed in the blood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are they washed in the blood of the Lamb? That hymn is not in our hymnal. Perhaps it should be. Because it does talk about what Jesus does for us. And so when God looks down upon us, he does not see our sin. He does not see our past. He doesn't see what we've done wrong. He sees his son. He sees us white as snow because of the blood of the Lamb. And he has a divine forgetfulness where he does not remember our sin. It's totally and completely forgiven. We, on the other hand, our forgiveness is not nearly that perfect. Because, as Gail said, we can forgive, but forgetting is hard. Peter came up to Jesus and said, Lord, how often should I forgive? And he thinks he's being good and saying, forgive seven times? That's pretty good, isn't it? If you've been wronged seven times. That's a good thing to forgive seven times. And well, by the time you've been wronged the eighth time, maybe then that person's beyond forgiveness. We shouldn't forgive them. So Peter thinks he's being pretty good. After all, in the Bible, when you see the number seven, that's a number of completion. And Jesus says, no. Because I see what you're doing here, Peter. I see that you're trying to set yourself up as more righteous than the rest of everyone else who's listening to me. I say to you, not seven times. Not nearly a complete number of times, but our translation here reads 77. Other translation reads 70 times seven. The point is, Jesus calls us to forgive so often that we forget how many times we forgive. God calls our grace, calls us that our grace and our forgiveness may be complete. The problem is that it isn't, and we know that. He tells this story, and we were talking this morning in Bible class about some of the genres of literature that are in the Bible. And so some of it is history or poetry or simple narrative of the Gospels. But a genre that we don't think about very often in the Bible is that of satire and that of comedy and humor. And Jesus tells this parable, which is, um, it might have elicited a couple of <laughs> chuckles for the people who heard it. He tells a story of a man who um, owed his master 10,000 talents. Put it this way, that's more money than you will ever see in your life. 10,000 talents, about 10,000, so let's just say 10,000 days wages he owed. Now, I'm not going to do math on Sunday morning. I don't like to do math any other morning, but certainly not on Sunday morning. But 10,000 days of work, that's a long, long time. And the answer of the sermon, he was going to put him in debtor's prison. They had debtor's prison back then until they paid off the debt. 
And the master got down on, and the servant got down on his knees and said, forgive me, I'll pay it back. Please give me more time. Don't send me to prison. Put on quite a show there. So the master said, I'm not only going to not send you to prison. He says, Jesus says, out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. That's pretty good. 10,000 days wages of debt forgiven? My goodness, at that point, I want to take out a bunch of loans and build myself a really nice house here. I wish our banks operated like that. What happens next? It's interesting. Master just owed 10,000 days wages of debt. Comes to someone who says he owes about 100 dinars. Shorthand, let's just say a hundred bucks. And so he grabs him and he throttles him and says, Pay me what you owe. And the man said, Give me some more time. I will pay this. I promise I will. And what happens? He gets thrown into that debtor's prison for an infinitesimally smaller percentage of debt than the man who owned the 10,000 the, 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 the 10, talents owed. The master who forgave the large debt heard about this and was none too pleased. And he threw that man who showed no forgiveness into prison. This is how seriously forgiveness is treated by Jesus. His entire life and ministry was one of reconciliation and was one of forgiveness. Forgiveness even to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is what forgiveness looks like. It hurts sometimes. And only he can do it perfectly. But we who have been forgiven of comparatively little are called to forgive as Christ forgives. Not by the shedding of our blood, but by perhaps the shedding of our pride. You see, when we have been wronged by someone, we in that moment have the moral high ground. And we like that, don't we? We like to think of ourselves as superior in some ways to others. But God calls us to check ourselves here. You don't have the moral high ground. You are as much a forgiven sinner as someone else. And by the way, if they are good enough for me that I sent my son to bleed and die for your neighbor, why can't you find it within yourself to forgive? Distilled, that is our theme today. Jesus calls us to forgive because to him, the one who has wronged us, is worthy of his loving his forgiveness. And if God can show love, we're called to show love too. It's not going to be perfect. And indeed, there are some things that sometimes happen to us which we wonder how we can possibly forgive. I worked with a man in my previous parish in Chicago when he was four years old. His father was murdered right in front of him. These are realities that we don't face so much here in this part of the world, but in other parts of the world they are. How can a four-year-old boy who is so scarred for life, who finds it so difficult to form stable relationships with others, how can that person learn? How can that person possibly forgive such a violent act against his own father? <clears throat> Other
terrible crimes against people. Violence, sexual assault, betrayal. And perhaps you're hearing our story today and saying, yeah, I have no trouble forgiving the small stuff, but something truly horrible happened to me once. I don't know how I can forgive that. There's a $10 theology word that we sometimes use called sanctification. Simply defined, it's the process of becoming more holy, more sanctified, more like God. And the key word there is process. These things don't happen overnight. They sometimes take a lifetime to happen. But if that is you this day, who have been a victim of something truly horrible, First of all, know that you are loved by God. That you stand forgiven. Even of that difficulty that you might have in forgiving others. And maybe a process of healing for you can be to start to let go and to start to forgive. It's not going to happen overnight, and that's okay. It might not even happen, perhaps, on this side of heaven. You try, you try so hard, and you can't bring yourself to do it. And God looks on you in that moment and loves you in that moment. <clears throat> but one day, you'll stand before Jesus. And in that moment, as you are surrounded by his love, it'll be okay. It'll be all right. You will stand forgiven. And in that forgiveness, all is made well. Forgiveness is hard, dear saints. It is truly difficult. For some, it's harder than others. And for some victims of violence, it can be nearly impossible. We pray in the Lord's Prayer this day, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We pray that God would grant us the grace each day to forgive the small things in our life. Maybe to go on someday to forgive the large things. But all the while trusting in his wonderful and abundant grace and mercy for us and for the entire world. You are forgiven. You are restored. You are set free. Free because of the divine forgetfulness of our God who looks on you and sees not what you've done, not what's in your past, not even what's in your present, but sees his Son, your Savior Jesus Christ, who brings you to peace, peace with those around you, peace with those whom have wronged you, peace with God. A peace which passes all understanding. <clears throat> Truly, in our theology of forgiveness, which passes all understanding. Keeping our hearts and minds on Christ Jesus, our Lord.